Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Episode number 96, the Jason York Hockey Journey. Presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pitlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we... Before the puck gets chipped in deep, Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 96, the Jason York Hockey Journey, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pitlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before the puck gets chipped in deep, the fort check starts and we begin this conversation. If you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, that I have the world's largest database of off-ice stick handling, passing, and hockey shooting drills, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota, or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon, and you want to schedule an in-person, off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. My next guest is former NHL defenseman Jason York who was selected 129th overall in the seventh round of the 1990 NHL entry draft by the Detroit Red Wings. This Nepean, Ontario native played in 757 NHL games, recording 42 goals, 187 assists for 229 points, as well as registering 621 penalty minutes over a 13-year professional hockey career. One of the NHL stops he had, in addition to Detroit, Anaheim, Nashville, and Boston, was in Ottawa, where we played together for three seasons with the Senators during the mid-90s. I can't remember when the last time I saw the guy was, so I'm excited to reconnect, see what's been going on in his life since his playing days, but more importantly, let's start with hearing his hockey journey. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Jason York to the show. Yorkie, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Hey, Pitt, this is great. Uh, looking forward to it, man. I love it. Um, this is going to be a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I, I heard you've been doing some great things in the state of Minnesota. You're, uh, you're now like a hockey uh, guru as far as skills and development. And I'm just hearing all kinds of great things about you. Well, thank you. Um, I... My older boy, Rem, who was born in Ottawa, his godmother uh, is from Ottawa because, you know, we became friends with them and she became the godmother. And um, I totally just forgot my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that happens, man. We're all getting older. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we'll just start this whole business uh, again. So we got, we got connected. Uh, because you do a little podcast uh, yeah. with Brett Wallace there in Ottawa, and I want to get to that eventually. But you had uh, yeah had me on as a guest. Oh, I know what I was going to say about that. It, it's uh, she had recommended when I started my podcast Come over on, a year sure. ago. To they said you should try to get on that uh, Wally uh, show. Was it Wally and Mathot like a year ago, or is that a different it one? Was, it, it was Wally and Mathot, and then Mathot. Well, you know he's fresh out of the game. Yeah, and when you're when you're fresh out of the game, your mind's going a million miles an hour. And he just he's got young kids. Um, he's doing a little bit of TV work now. He just got too busy, and the podcast is now three days a week. Uh, it's myself, Bobby Ryan, who's part of the podcast as well, and, and Brent Wallace, and uh, it's great. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we have guests on like yourself, tell old stories, have some laughs, and talk a lot about the Ottawa Senators. That's awesome. I so just to go back to the story, uh, Carla, she she recommended, you know, I tried to get on that show, and she found out I was doing the podcast, and I, 
you know, emailed the show right away and heard nothing but crickets till a week ago. Yeah, till I got on. See, Pitt? <laughs> That's what happened, all right. I, I get on, they say, we're getting Lance Pitt, like, full <laughs> legend on the show. And we people were excited, man, because that era that you and I played in, um, I was joking with you on the podcast, I call it the builder's era. And you can't have any good team without a solid foundation. And uh, you and I, we were we had the work boots on, man. We helped uh, – we helped bring that brand, the Ottawa Senators, from a very bad team to, to where it is now. It's, it's a great franchise. It is. So we got a lot to talk about, what you're doing now, uh, our Ottawa days. But uh, how I like to start all the interviews with uh, the people that I have on the show is to have you rewind the tape a little bit. And let's take a moment, look in the rear view mirror and go back to the beginning. Where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? Your parents, siblings, friends, your introduction to hockey and other sports. Basically, tell the listeners in a nutshell what the heck it was like growing up, Jason York. <laughs> well, I, I got a re- I got a pretty funny story. I, I know you, you're a guy that likes a good story. Oh yeah. But I, I came from a hockey family. I have two older brothers. Um, my oldest brother Jamie uh, was a really good hockey player, and then my second oldest brother Jeff. They were a year apart. Uh, they are 61 and 60 now, so a little bit older than me. I'm, I'm, I'm 52, but I looked up to them because they played hockey. I went to their games. I went to watch them. And, uh, my dad used to build an outdoor rink in the backyard for them. But by the time I was old enough, he stopped doing the rink because I also had a younger brother and a sister and all five of us played hockey and uh, we had one car. So it was a really busy household, little tiny house, about 1,200 square feet. I shared a room with my brother. My brother shared a room. It was, uh, wow. you know, it was it, we were, we were a, a family that our whole life revolved around sports. We played baseball in the summer, hockey in the winter. Um, but I first started playing. My dad, because my brothers played, he coached them, coached my sister's hockey. He was one of the first – people in Ottawa back in the seventies to really, to really be a pioneer on girls hockey in the Ottawa area. And my dad coached, as I got older, I would go out and skate with the girls team for extra ice. But when I was really young and I was four years old, my dad decided he was going to coach me. So we only had one ice time a week. It was, it was 6 AM out in Canada and I lived in the PN and I was at four years old Pitt. I loved watching my Saturday morning cartoons because back when you and I were young, you can only get the cartoons Saturday morning. Remember, you oh, waited yeah. all week. You waited all week for your cartoons. So I went to the first practice, didn't really want to go. Second, second practice, my dad's the coach at six in the morning. I, I, I make a hard stance and I say, I'm not going. I'm not going to the rink because I want to watch my morning cartoons. <laughs> so I ended up quitting the team at age four to watch cartoons <laughs> my, <laughs> my poor father had to go out every morning 6 a.m and coach a team but his son didn't go to practice <laughs> so so the funny thing my first ever hockey picture as a kid my dad made me come to the end of the year photo and i'm in my uniform but i got boots on because i didn't go on the ice so, and for for anybody that's got kids out there, you know, everyone's, you know, it might not, it might be too early. Maybe some kids can skate at three, four. Maybe some don't want to. Well, I was, I was the one that didn't want to. So, um, the next year at the ripe age of, of five, I made a huge comeback into the game <laughs> and started and, and started playing novice or whatever it was called, mite hockey. And since then, Pitt. My dad never coached me again in hockey. Oh, no way. No, he refused. He coached <laughs> my, my sister, my brother. So he never coached me in hockey ever again. He coached me in, he coached me in baseball every year. But hockey, it was just me uh, going to the rink. Wow. And from there, I think that year, I ended up playing out and goalie. And then the following year, um, I started going to the outdoor rink a lot. Uh, even at age six and seven, my parents would drop me off and I would skate on the outdoor rink all the time. And then as I got older, I was at the outdoor rink every single night. 
Like my parents will tell me I would leave after school at four o'clock and I wouldn't come home till nine o'clock at night. And I didn't eat when I came home. It was, I just loved going to the ODR and on weekends I'd be there all day. Yeah. I'd be the, and I would be there where they're turning the lights off. And that's, that's where I really started to love the game of hockey. Just going to the outdoor rink, dropping the puck, put, putting the sticks in the middle and having a huge outdoor game. And I'd bring my friends. And in the summer it was road hockey. I would, uh, I lived in an area with, a lot of guys, a lot of friends, and I had a couple of nets, and I'd bring all the sticks, and we'd play road hockey all summer. So for me, it was, I really loved the unstructured part of it, Pitt, like mm-hmm. outdoor hockey, road hockey. And then in, I was a really good player when I was eight and nine, uh, and I was always one of the better players on the team. But then at the age of 10, 11, I was kind of a short, fat kid, <laughs> and I didn't grow. So. Yeah. I became like, I was still a good player. And then um, I remember on my team, it was, you know, there was some players that were, that were maturing quicker and faster and bigger. And I always, I went from being the kid that was, you know, still good, but not the best. And then by, uh, I think by the age of 16, I had this huge growth spurt in a summer and uh, ended up, ended up catching up to the rest of the guys, which you see all the time in minor hockey. And then, uh, and then from there, um, I was still wasn't the, one of the better players. I was good, but I went in, in our local area here in Ottawa, we have tier two junior A and each junior A team is allowed to protect five players. I didn't get protected by my local Nepean team. So I went off to play in a different town in Smith Falls. And then that one year in Smith Falls, I think I was 16 years old playing against 20 year olds. I, I, I really, uh, I had a very good coach and I just, I just took the next level as a player, got improved a ton. And then the year after that, um, this is kind of funny because I never, I just played hockey. I, I, I didn't think anything of it. I, my brother, uh, my one brother went off to Princeton on a hockey, uh, it was a hockey scholarship to Princeton and I wanted to do that. That's what I saw myself doing, going to school, doing that. <laughs> my my mom pulled me aside and she said, "You know, your marks aren't that good." You know, <laughs> so the chance, so the chances of you getting a scholarship aren't great. And that's what I want to do. And we had the Ottawa Sixty Sevens here, right in town, and I never even paid attention or even went to one of their games. I never had seen an NHL game. I'd never been to an NHL game, and I just I wanted to get a scholarship. But then one day. I got a knock on the door and it was the head scout of the Sudbury Wolves. He came over and he said, we're going to pick you in the uh, first pick in the second round. And I said, well, I, I don't want to play junior and get a scholarship. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then my, uh, my parents and I went off to the OHL draft that year. And uh, I ended up going in the first round to another team, Hamilton. And that's kind of how my fate was decided. It was like, okay, I guess, I guess I'm going to the OHL. But the one thing my father did, Pitt, and this was before they started doing those scholarship offers for players in the OHL, my dad hired a family lawyer, and he said he's not going unless he doesn't sign in the NHL. You, you guys are going to agree to pay for all his school. No way. And Yeah, and this was back in the 80s, and uh, we got Hamilton, the team I was drafted by, to agree to do that, and uh, so then I went. And I went off and played my first year junior. So that's that's kind of how I like. It was weird. It was I. I never. I just kind of played the play because I liked playing, especially outdoor hockey. And I was a pretty good athlete. But my goal was never to. I wasn't playing to make the NHL. Obviously, that'd be awesome if you did. But back then in Ottawa, there was no NHL team. If you wanted to watch hockey, it was on Saturday nights, and I didn't really watch hockey. I just played. I played all the time. And I love sports. And then I just, as time went on, I got better. But I I got all my reps and all my practice without even knowing it. I was doing it on the outdoor rink every single day. Um, so that's, and then I would practice with my sister's team and I practice with my own team. So without even knowing it, I was becoming a better player through being on the ice and practicing and, and, and just getting better and better. And then I, I'd be, I, I'd be what you classify kind of a late bloomer, good, young, didn't grow, finally grew, kept playing. 
and then by the time I hit junior, I was a pretty good player. And then uh, in junior, it was a, it was it was a weird uh, it was a very difficult time in my life because I went to a junior team in Hamilton. Um, we had a coach by the name of Bill LaForge, where hockey back then was it was it was a lot different than it is now. It was it was a lot of bullying, a lot of uh, initiations, a lot of stuff that went on that I was ready to quit hockey after that year, but I, I was just, it was so tough. Um, and I was their first round pick and the year was so difficult that at the end of the year, I said to my parents, I'm, I think I'm going to quit hockey. I go, this isn't fun anymore. And, uh, did you, luck- can I, can I, did you share that with anyone or did you bottle that up? Well, I told my parents Okay, you did. and my yeah, like it was bad, like the bus, the bus rides and the initiations. And, you know, I could tell some stories. Like I don't like it, just some like people would be pretty shocked at what the stuff. And back then, a lot, it, it was kind of it was junior hockey culture, what was going on. Yeah, yeah. But our, our, our coach was a guy by the name of Bill LaForge. And it was at a whole other level, like a whole different level, like bus rides where guys are doing stuff that. If this went on today, the coach would be in jail. Like he would be in jail. Yeah. And uh, he's not around anymore. He passed away whenever, 10, 15 years ago. But just a, just a horrible, horrible experience. And my parents, they didn't know what was going on, but they had an idea. And then at the end of the year, I was throughout all of that pit, I somehow was rated in the NHL draft. I only had 13 points. But I was six one. I was a right shot defense when I was a good skater. So I guess scouts could see the upside. So I went to the draft in Montreal that year after that year in Hamilton. And I was supposed to get picked in the draft. And I sat there in Montreal and I never got picked. I went home and it was, uh, it was tough, but yeah. I, I had a tour. I, I didn't have a good season, like for rookies. I was there based on potential, but the, the funny thing about this was, not funny, before the draft, when I was thinking of quitting, Hamilton traded me. They traded me to the Windsor Spitfires, and I had had a conversation with Windsor, and I became excited to play again because they had a guy by the name of Tom Webster, who was the coach. And this is really cool. They had just hired a new assistant coach. He was 21 years old. He had played for the Windsor Spitfires the year before as an overage defenseman. And his name was Paul Maurice. Mm. Uh, and Paul Maurice went on, as you know, to coach in the NHL. But when I, after not getting drafted and I'm going through that, coming back in the summer and training and talking to the Paul Maurice and Tom Webster over the summer, I became really excited for the new chapter, a new team, a fresh start. And when I got there, Paul Maurice was a defense coach. And the connection he made with me, Pitt, was unbelievable. He worked with me after practice. We worked on skills. And I got this confidence that I never really had before. I was confident, but it was beaten out of me my first year junior. I was not confident. I was unsure of myself. I wasn't sure if I liked the game of hockey anymore. But I got in Windsor, all that kind of came back to me. And I went from having... 13 points my rookie season to uh, 19 goals and I think 63 points my second year. Yeah, that's a huge jump, 50 points. Yeah, I won the most improved player in the OHL and uh, I had an incredible year. Some reason, though, I didn't get drafted again. (laughs) And then uh, the next season in my year of junior, I got traded. Uh, It's the way it works in the OHL. When a team's trying to win the Memorial Cup, they and they know they're going to go, they load, it up, they load up on players. So the Kitchener Rangers traded for me from Windsor, which was a great move. Kitchener was a great team, great coach. And I ended up the following year um, going to Memorial Cup with the Kitchener Rangers. And uh, I had a great year. I had 20 goals as a defenseman, led the playoffs in scoring for defensemen, went to the Memorial Cup, we ended up losing in double overtime to Oshawa, oh. Eric Windros. Yeah, double overtime. It was a heartbreaker. Oh. Um, and then after that year, after three years junior, my agent calls me. He's like, okay, you're going to get drafted in the third or fourth round. 
So we are coming to the draft. I said, no way. I'm not going to the draft again. I'm not going through <laughs> that again. So it's in Vancouver. He convinces me to go. And I go to the draft. And again, I'm sitting there. And your agent usually comes to sit beside you when he thinks you're getting picked. So he comes by the third round. I don't get picked. The fourth round, I don't get picked. The fifth round, the sixth round. <laughs> and after the sixth round, they take a break. So an hour break. And I said to my, uh, is there with my parents? No, let's just go. I go, I can't take it. I go, let's just go. I go, I'm not getting picked. Um, so anyhow, I, I decided to stay. And then uh, I got picked in the seventh round by Detroit, which was great. It was awesome to get drafted. Um, but uh, it took me a long time after that pit to make the lead. Kind of similar to yourself. I had to. Uh, Can I stop you for one second? Yeah. I just want to. I know you f you felt bad at the draft about, you know, first not getting drafted one time and your second year there and mom and dad, let's leave. You know, you're drafted in the seventh round. Uh, I was drafted in the ninth round. Okay. So yeah. there's your feel good for your, you know, about yourself. You. <laughs> I didn't yeah, know. Right? I didn't know there was a ninth round, but uh, you know exactly. Everyone else has a you know. There's always someone on the other side that maybe doesn't have it as good as you do. The thing that exactly, exactly, and that's what that's what you you figure out when you get older, right? Yeah. Uh, but I went to this Detroit team. That's who I was picked by, and on their blue line they had coffee, they had Lidstrom, they had Mark Howe, they had all these. <laughs> like there was so. I went to Detroit's training camp without. A, I didn't, it didn't give me a contract yet, and I'm there, and I'm not. I'm just thinking, you know what? I, I just want to get make the to the American League. So anyhow, I'm the first one cut from camp, and they send me back to junior, and uh, I have a decision to make. I can either go play junior, or I can use that school package of mine and and start going to school, like go play uh, CIS hockey. They call it U Sports now. So I actually went on a recruiting trip. This kind of ties into you, Penn. I went into a, a recruiting trip to the University of Prince Edward Island. Oh, no way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know you played for the PEI Center. Yeah. Uh, the UPEI Panthers was the name of the, uh, the the school's team there. So they flew me in. Uh, I saw the campus. And it's pretty cool. You know, I, I was like, you know, I'm going to go to school get my education, play hockey, and I love to be a gym teacher. That's kind of what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a gym teacher. And that was my plan. So uh, I come back to my well, – I'm, I'm dating my my girlfriend, Laurel, at the time, who's now my wife. And I, I go back to Windsor, and uh, I talk to her parents, and I say, you know, it's – I just – I want to get my schooling, and, you know, it's, I don't see hockey as part of my future. And she's like, well, whatever you think. And then my junior coach, Brad Smith, he really wanted me to come back and play as a 20 year old. But if you play as a 20 year old, your chances is a very slim chance you're going anywhere. You're playing against 16, 17, 18 year old kids. And I'll never forget this. Brad Smith, former Toronto Maple Leaf, said to me, he goes, and I've always remember this. He goes, if you don't come back and try one more time, you're going to regret it for the rest of your life. You're always going to wonder if I wouldn't bet on myself, could I have made it in hockey? He goes, don't, don't, don't give up on yourself. And uh, I said, yeah. And I negotiated with him. I said, okay, well, <laughs> this is kind of funny because I, my girlfriend's family was unbelievable, great family. And I, uh, I had been in a billet house for a while and I wanted to leave my billet house and move somewhere else. I said, okay, I'll come back, but I want to move into my girlfriend's house. I'm 20 years old. And he's like, I'm not a chance. And I said, well, I'm not coming back then. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, I'll talk to the general manager. So he comes back. He's like, okay, you can live at your girlfriend's place. So I ended up, it actually became, it actually was a pretty good thing because junior hockey teams back then, there was a little bit of drinking going on and guys had a good time. I think doing that for that year kind of kept me from maybe partying too much. Yeah. Which some guys, which some guys can do in junior, as you know. So I, I, I played my 20 year old season. I it made me the captain of the team. And uh, let me tell you, tell everyone what, what happened. Your best year was when you uh, were traded to Windsor. You went from your first season getting 13 points to now uh, getting 63 points. You go back as a 20 year old, you score 13 goals, 80 assists, 93 points in 66 games. 
You bet on yourself and it paid off. I bet on myself, Pitt. I just said, and I just, I really trained hard that summer before my last year junior. I hammered the weights. I ran. I said, if I'm going to do this, I'm going all in. And I trained harder than I ever trained. And I had a great year. I led the entire league in scoring for defensemen. I made the all-star team. It was a great season. Um, and uh, and I got rewarded. You'll love this. You know how players now are on two-way contracts. You have a, you get an NHL salary. And then you get an American League salary. So back then, when you and I were playing, there was there was the AHL, the American League. Then they had the I. Remember the International Hockey League? Oh yeah. And then they had the the Cheese Coast, the East Coast League. Yeah. <laughs> so Detroit says to me, "We're going to sign you, but because we have so many defensemen, you're getting a four way contract." <laughs> I've never I heard. A, I've never heard of a four way contract. I signed a four way. Oh, uh, if I, 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 you know what? It's all that money was different. So if I played for Detroit, I was going to get 120 grand. If I went to Adirondack, their affiliate in the A, I'd get 30. If I went to the IHL, it was 27. And if I went to the Hampton Road Admirals in the East Coast League, coached by John Brophy, I was getting 22 grand. <laughs> and uh, and they gave me 20 grand to sign. I, and I was happy. I'm like, 20 grand? Yeah. Woo-hoo. Heck this yeah. Is great. <laughs> and um, so anyhow, the next, that summer after my junior year, same thing, got on the gas, trained super hard, went to Detroit's camp again, and I was first cut again. No way. But now, but now I'm down in the minors. And as you know, in the minors, I'm trying to make the AHL team now because I'm battling up in Detroit. There's Paul Coffey, there's Lidstrom, there's – all these great players, but I am battling the first rounder, the second rounder, the guy they signed on a one-way contract at a college, the Russian free agent on a, on a one-way. And there's all these guys in the minors. And for the first two months, uh, I'm down there living in a hotel as you know, that, that's what happens. And mm-hmm. every single day, Ted, I'm going to the rink. My first order of business when I get to the rink, make sure my name tag is still up in my stall. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm still here. And then finally, after two months, Barry Melrose was the coach. He pulls me into his office and he says to me, you really get 80 assists last year in junior? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I did. And I said, maybe a couple, maybe we're phantoms. I go, but you know, probably 75. <laughs> so, <laughs> he, he laughs he goes well you think you can do that here and i'm like i don't know about 80 and i go but i'll you know i'll try my hardest and i won't let you down he goes listen detroit wants me to send you down he goes well, fuck them i like you he goes you're staying go get a house no so way. barry melrose barry melrose gave me an opportunity in american league and Throughout the first three months of that year, I was the leading scorer on the team for all the defensemen. And my season was going good. And I got lucky because the second round draft pick had a bad shoulder and he missed the first part of the year. So I got an opportunity because of that. Yeah. But then at Christmas, I broke my ankle. And uh, I, I came back after a month and I was still playing. But then when the playoffs started, everybody was healthy again and Detroit had lost in the first round and they were, they wanted their high draft picks playing. So for the first, my first year in the American league, I was, had a great start, got hurt, came back. And then for the first round of the playoffs, I was healthy, scratched every game. Round two, healthy, scratched every game. (laughs) Round three, healthy, scratched every game. We had a really good team. Yeah. We had, uh, and we were, and I probably could have been playing. I was good enough, but I wasn't. But I didn't, I didn't really think about things. I just went to, I went to practice every day. I worked really hard. I enjoyed it. And I waited and I waited. And then finally in the fourth round of the playoffs, we're playing, we're playing the St. John's Maple Leafs, Toronto's farm team. And it's, uh, we're playing in the finals. And, uh, I had my playoff beard on. We had all had the playoff beards. So we were super excited. Uh, Detroit Red Wings had lent us their private jet because they had a team jet. And imagine the guys in the minors were flying on this jet. 
going down to play uh, in the minors. Wow. And Mel, Melrose calls me in. We're down two games to one in the series. Calls me in, in right before game four. And I hadn't played in two months. And he goes, you're going in. <laughs> and I'm like, pardon? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, pardon? <laughs> Taking a mini but, donut out of your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> And he sat out the second round draft pick and put me in. And I remember to this day, Pat, I was playing game four in St. John's and Brian Murray was a general manager. Doug McLean was just a general manager. I could see them in the stands watching. And I just went and played. I played game four, game five, game six, and game seven. And I played the best hockey I'd ever played that year. And uh, just played well at the right time, got my opportunity. And uh, we ended up winning the Calder Cup. And I, it's funny too, the guy that got pulled out of the lineup shaved his playoff beard off as soon as he got pulled out of the lineup. Um, really? And, yep. That kind of sealed and, his fate then, right? I think so. Um, but hey, I'm sure he's disappointed, right? And I got my opportunity. And then after that season, I, I got confidence that I could play at that level and I could meet. And, and I'll tell you something funny. Like everybody asks me, like, when did you ever think you were going to play in the NHL? And I said, I never did. I just, I just thought day by day, just the yeah. process, the process, working, playing, uh, being a good teammate, all those things. And then the next year, we start over again. We go to training camp in Detroit. I'm first cut again, break down to the minors again. But this time, when I went back to the minors, I had a lot more confidence because I played and now I, when I went back, I was had a little bit of swagger, but I still had the work ethic. Barry Melrose was gone. He was now in uh, LA coaching the LA Kings and a couple of our players that had got opportunities in the NHL from winning in the minors. So I went down and I started off and I had a great start to the season. I was confident and two months into the season, I get a call. Uh, from our coach, and he says, Jason, Detroit wants you to go up and play. And I'll never forget this because I answered the phone and I didn't believe it was him. I thought it was Bob Boogner. Bob Boogner was on the team. <laughs> and I said, I'm like, Boogie, I know this is you. Quit bullshitting me. And I hung up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the coach calls me back. And he goes, Yeah, it's not Boogie, it's Neil Brown. Uh, Detroit wants you to play tonight. And then Pitt, I'll never forget it. I was in shock because until that point, I never really thought I was going to play. I just, I was just playing and doing my thing. And then I was like, holy shit, I'm going to the NHL. And then I went and because I, I was so green, I didn't even know what to do. I got to the airport and then I landed in Detroit and I waited. I'm like, is somebody supposed to come pick me up? What do I do now? And then, it was like my second time on an airplane. First time was the draft. This was my second time. Yeah. <laughs> First time ever on a plane was going to the NHL draft. <laughs> and then uh, I, I, I had the number to the rink, and I called the rink, and the trainer answered. He's like, get in the cab, for God's sake. He goes, nobody's waiting there with a sign. And I'm like, well, I don't know. So, <laughs> My first game, I was late. My first NHL game, I was late for. I got there as the players were going off their warm-up. And Steve Eiserman's going on the ice, and he sees me. And he goes, hey, kid, 100 bucks, you're late. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I, got, I got my gear on really quick, went out for warm-ups. And uh, this is kind of cool, too. Actually, two things that are circling back to, uh, to the pit licks. First game was against the Minnesota North Stars. So uh, I might have uh, been at that game. Yeah. Was it, it, was it in uh, Minnesota? No, it was up to Joe. It then was it wasn't okay. Then yeah. that, that's so less I, that's less important now. <laughs> exactly, but it was Minnesota, which was cool. Yeah. Um, remember nothing about the game, but it was cool. Like it's all a blur. But then after getting called up for that game, when they sent me back right after the game, ended up getting called up three more times that year, and I went back and had a, an amazing season out of Rondack. But after that season's over. Again, now it's year three. I go back to Detroit. And again, I have an amazing training camp, but I'm, a, I'm in the first round of cuts again. Like I'm, I'm cut again. Um, and go back to Adirondack for a third year. 
uh, and have an amazing season. I, I make the all-star team, get called up seven times that year. I was like a yo-yo that year, up, down, up, mm-hmm. down. Um, and that's how it was back then. But one of the funny story here, they called me up to play in Chicago once. And uh, it's an afternoon game. So I flew up the night before, stayed in the hotel, uh, getting ready for warm-up to go uh, play in Chicago Stadium. And Dave Lewis, the coach, pats me on the shoulder. He's like, yeah, we've changed our mind. You're not going to play. But we'd like you to fly back right now and play tonight in Adirondack. So packed my bag, walked through the Chicago Stadium with my equipment bag, got in a taxi, got to the airport, made it back for my game that night in Adirondack, uh, halfway through the second period. <laughs> so it's like... <laughs> It was crazy. That year, getting, I, got, I got called up and down seven times. I got one time, my equipment didn't make it. And I went back to play in Adirondack. And I have no gear. So before the game, I go around to the guys on the team. And I borrowed Bob Bugner's skates and other guys' gloves, somebody else's helmet. And I played a game without my own gear. It was not even my own skates. But that, as you know, like, that, that's the stuff you did back then in the minors. Uh, and you did it. I didn't, even ha- I didn't even have my own stick pattern my entire time in the minors. I, I would get a stick from Detroit uh, that another guy was using. It was a wood stick, and I'd bring it back. And to customize it, my, uh, our trainer was actually um, the wood shop teacher at school in Adirondack. <laughs> he, would, he would take my, my stick to school and sand it down for me. <laughs> and, and, it's crazy. It's crazy. So awesome. Um, but that 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 was three really insane. It was so much fun playing in the minors. But after three years, um, I had moved up the depth chart to now I was Detroit's number one prospect, and and it was really tough to make that team because I, I mentioned the guys on the blue line. Plus, they would sign free agents. So finally, my fourth training camp. After three years in the minors, um, I go back to Detroit. And But before I go back, I stay in Windsor that summer. And I drive over to Joe Lewis Arena every day. And I train one-on-one with Detroit's strength and conditioning coach. And, and, I, and I was the only guy doing that. And I said to myself, I am not getting cut this year. I am making this team. I'm going to do everything I humanly can to make this team. So Detroit's test, big test, was the mile and a half run. The year before I did the mile and a half in 10.20 seconds, which was not great, but decent. And I was really good at the bench press and that other stuff. But I had to get better at the run. So I ran every night. And that next year in camp, I finished third out of 80 guys in the run. Um, Went it from... 10.20 10.20 to 8.20. I shaved a minute. Wow. And then I finished second in pull-ups and first in bench press. And you remember those tests. Yeah, yeah. People, p- people might think they're meaningless, but it shows that you and I know this. It shows the coaching staff that you've done the work, right? So that year in 1994, and remember 1994, if it's an important year, they had me partnered with Paul Coffey. He was my defense partner in training camp. And I'm saying, I come home at night and I'm talking to my girlfriend, Laura. I'm like, shit, I, I'm going to make the team this year. And I'm going to be partnering with Paul Coffey. Like this could, Detroit's predicted to win the Stanley Cup. And all my time in the minors is paying off my hard work. Yeah. You remember what happened in 1994? No. We had a lockout. Oh, is that what happened that year? So they, they canceled the friggin' first part of the season. Uh-huh. So I'm like, the hell (laughs) i got and you know like you put the work and you do that so they canceled the season um we restart in january uh detroit is predicted to win the stanley cup that year but another thing another important thing happened to detroit that year they uh bob probert had gotten into trouble off the ice and uh they no longer had a tough guy so detroit needed to trade for a tough guy we got to give to get. So I ended up getting traded in February for Stu Grimson. Oh, no. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so after all that, 
and uh, where, where did you go after that? I went to Anaheim. I went to Anaheim. It was actually a funny story. We were we were flying to Anaheim, actually to San Jose to play a game. I played ten games with Detroit. The season had restarted, I think, in January, and it was a shortened schedule, and uh, there was all kinds of pressure on Detroit to win that year, and they needed to win. Um, so. I get on the plane to go out on this West Coast trip. And on the way out to San Jose, the plane stops. And we pick up Patisse off on the way out. So everyone's doing the numbers on the plane. They're like, someone's getting traded when the plane lands. Because <laughs> we, <have too> <laughs> <many guys. laughs> we have too many guys. So it, it lands in San Jose. Scotty Bowman was now the coach. Scotty calls me to the office. And it was myself and Mike Sillinger got traded for Grimson and somebody else. Uh, Mark Ferner, Mark Ferner, uh, and Gripson for me and Sillinger. And then I ended up going to Anaheim, which was a young team. I think it was their second year in the league. And I ended up all my, all my stuff I had done in Detroit, the playing and the working. Anaheim viewed me as a guy that was ready to play right away. So I ended up becoming a full time NHLer with Anaheim. Uh, and that's kind of how my career got started going. It was Detroit prepared me. For, for for Anaheim, got an opportunity to play in Anaheim right away. And then from Anaheim, a couple of years, traded to Ottawa. And that's where where things really got interesting because the timing was great, as you know. You were there, I was there. Getting to play on a team like Ottawa and then starting to play in the playoffs, really, uh, it was great for a lot of guys. It, it really, for me, it it uh it solidified me into a good defenseman and the timing was great we had a great system all hungry young guys and and that, and that's kind of how my career really got kick started yeah. but it was similar to yourself a lot of you had to you had to really fight and scratch and claw and overcome a lot of things and and not give up on yourself right well you apparently you knew my story but yeah i didn't know your story because we basically paralleled each other. I mean, I played four yeah. years in, in Philly and then I got a, I got picked up, you know, went signed with Ottawa and you know, that first year was that lockout year that you're talking about. Yeah. And, uh, I end up getting, uh, an opportunity. Um, yeah. but after you played some, you know, logged a lot of time on the bus in the minors. And so I didn't know that about you. I, I, I I like you even a little bit more now. Right, Pitt, see, we're, <laughs> we're, we're we're kind of the same, like yeah. different, di different players. Like you're more of a physical guy. Um, I never had but, 80, 80 assists, never in like nine yeah, years but, ever. But it's all about the grind, right? Yeah. You gotta, when you're not a, when you're not a first round draft pick, nothing is given to you. You you don't get you don't get any mulligans. You got to be good when it counts. So and you got to. It's 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 you know how it is. Yeah. Can I ask you something? So when you're when you're in Detroit, and I mean it's it's years are going by that you know you're putting in the work and you're you're getting a little taste and but then you get shut down. You're year after year. You're the first one sent to the minors. You know your parents. You know they they would give you their opinion earlier in your career. You got an agent now. What were people saying at that point? You know, just keep your head down and do what you got to do, or were they saying get the heck out of there? Nothing. It was it was just me. It was all support from my parents. They would they would when I was in Adirondack, it was a four hour drive for them. They'd come to every home game oh, cool. and they loved it. They loved watching, and it was never poor me, poor me. It was it was always positive. You played a great game, and, and it was just it was just support. And I was – nobody in my family was coddled. Um, you know, I'd say maybe my mom, when you're younger, she'd lie to you and tell you you always played well. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was a guy, though, that struggled with confidence when I was younger. Um, I, I had played – you know, just rewinding, but I had played on a team where um, – I was coached by a, one of the one of the parents on the team coached our team for five years, and maybe there was some favoritism given to certain players, but and that would piss my parents off. But they never they never let things like that trickle down to me as an excuse. Like you you would 
you were always on you. And I had to like, when I was younger, we didn't have a lot of money and I had to get a job delivering papers. And when I did my paper, it, I, I would give the money to my parents to help pay for my hockey. And my brothers all worked and we, like it was a family that all the money that we made was put into hockey. And I'll give you a straight up my dad. When my dad passed away, he had remortgaged the house so many times that a house he had paid $16,000 for in 1968, he owed $200,000 on that house. 200000 All for the kids. All for the kids. Holy cow. Like we, we didn't have a lot, but we always had sticks. We always had tape. We always had enough that we could still play hockey. Like we weren't, we weren't poor, but my dad had to really manipulate the finances in order for us to play hockey. Wow. And I'll, ne- I'll never forget that. Yeah. It was, it, it was, it was very selfless of my father. That, wow. Well, you know, when, uh, when you decide to become a parent, you right away, uh, at least me, I decided I wanted to be a master craftsman <laughs> and I was going <laughs> to do anything for my kids, you know, and I think, yeah. Uh, you, uh, learned that from your dad and that's exactly what your dad and mom are about. Uh, so yep. awesome. Okay. Um, we are like 45 minutes into this thing. And so I just want to, I like to keep them around an hour and we're not even close to, to the tip of the iceberg right now. So what I'd <laughs> like to do is could we talk? you know, let's transition into the Ottawa time and then, uh, um, talk about that for a little bit. And then maybe we can do a part two of this and, uh, finish it, finish it up and get through the rest of your career. And then what uh, your, your family, you started having kids, girlfriend, now wife and kids. Uh, that's what I want to hear about. Are you cool with that? Yeah. Yeah. Anything. Ask me anything. No. Okay. I'm just saying, are you cool with us doing another episode after this one? Yeah, sure. I don't care. I got time. I know you got time. I know you got time. <laughs> the, thing is, the thing is, because I've done TV and radio so much, I can babble forever. Oh, I know. But this this is awesome for me. I, I just want to, I mean, I know it's only 1225. It's 125 your time, but I just want to crack a bottle of wine and just keep, keep the conversation going. Oh, I, old, stories are, old, old stories are great, eh? Yeah. Okay, so Detroit... Uh, you know, you, it was awesome for you. You transitioned out to Anaheim, and that really prepared you for that opportunity. When the ball or puck was given to you, you just went and solidified yourself as an everyday NHL player, which is is very difficult. It is very difficult. Even, you know, if you're playing regularly in the NHL, that doesn't mean you're necessarily – uh, an everyday NHL player, but both of us kind of found our way to, to Ottawa. And for you, that had to have been pretty doggone special, being that you're from the PN, which is right there. It was, it was special, Pitt, but it was very nerve-wracking because I had, I had thought when I got traded to Anaheim, I had bought a house there. I was playing as their number two defensemen. Oh, wow. And I was playing over 20 minutes a night in Anaheim. And here's the thing with the NHL that you and I know. When you think you've arrived and you think you've got it figured out, that's when you sometimes get a gut punch. <laughs> and you think you think it maybe is going to be easy. And my first year in Anaheim went really well. I only played the 15 games in the shortened season, but I had eight assists in 15 games. I was I was averaging almost half a point. I would have transitioned to maybe a 30, 40 point year. Yeah. And then when I went back the following year, I had a, I had a, I had a, I had a really good season and I put up some points again. And, but the year after when I went back, um, the team still hadn't made the playoffs. Ron Wilson was the coach. He ended up bringing in, um, a defense when he liked the guy by the name of Adrian Plasma. And it became apparent to me in training camp that that they were trying to transition Plasvik into my role. Ron Nolson had had him in Vancouver. Um, so I ended up getting traded to Ottawa 
with Sean Van Allen after training camp. And I really had only had the half year and the one good year in Anaheim on a non-playoff team. So coming to Ottawa, and you know this, the year before the Senators had the worst record in hockey. And I start thinking, and if I go play on that team and things don't go well, my career could be over. I could be back in the minors. <laughs> like right. I'm on, I've got one year left on my deal. I was on a one-way contract, which was nice. I had signed it in Detroit, uh, thanks to my agent. Um, my agent, uh, I probably didn't deserve a one-way contract at the time, but he did. I think he said to them, he goes, uh, I think they were representing Fedorov or somebody at the time. They said, yeah, we'll get Fedorov done. But the, by the way, uh, better give York a one-way too. That will, uh, so anyhow, I had the one-way, <laughs> but it was expiring. And when I went to Ottawa, it wasn't, it wasn't, like there was inner competition for jobs there. Sean Hill was there. Stan Neshkash was there. And they were the guys the year before that I think everybody assumed were going to get the important minutes and the important role. And Sean Hill was hurt. Neshkash was hurt. And then it ended up becoming a transition year where I came in. You were there. Wade Redden's first year. So it was a, it was a little bit of a battle for a bunch of guys that were trying to prove they were they were full time NHLers or whatever top four whatever position. And Jacques Martin. Hold on, hold on. Let me, let me inter- let me interrupt you here for a second. So, you and I, I'm just looking at Hockey DB, both of us. So you get into Ottawa. Your first season there is uh, 96-97. And you, were you straight in the off season or during the season? I came to Ottawa right at the end of training camp. I met the team in Lake Placid. So okay. I came in the Lake Placid. Okay. So that was totally, your first year. Yeah. Totally. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I, I, yeah. Just wait for Lake Placid for a second here. I just want to set this up. So I had been in Ottawa for two years prior to that, two seasons. Yep. And my first year was the lockout year, 94, 95. Uh, after the lockout year, played uh, 15 games. The next year, I played 28. And then the 96-97, you come into training camp, and yep. I'm, I'm, I haven't made training camp. I, I haven't, you know, made made the team out of camp yet. Yep. So that year, uh, you're talking about Stan and Sean Hill. Yes, I, I end up being the the seventh defenseman. So you're playing ahead of me. And then yep. I don't know if you remember, but it was five games into the season. Both of those guys, Sean Hill and Ness Cash, they went down knee injuries for the rest of the year. Do you remember that? That's right. That's what happened. Exactly. And that's that's when I became an everyday player in the NHL. And I was on a two, two-way contract at the time. Just grinding. Like, you're you're coming to the rink every day, just hoping for an opportunity. And I'm, I'm in a little bit of a different situation. Yeah. I'm, com- I'm coming there, and they want me to play. Right. Uh, they want me to play. Um, we're, we're, we're a little bit different players, um, but they slightly, want me to be. Slightly, just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but both right shot Ds, like we're both, we're both battling for the same, for, for minutes and stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that, that was good for you, but it was, it was also good for me because Sean Hill and I were similar players. Sean was supposed to be a puck mover that had a little bit of offense. Um, and then Stan was, I guess, more your style. Um, so, in essence, you're you're replacing Nescash, and I'm replacing Hill. When you really look at it, yeah, maybe, yeah. That's that's kind of. So for me, it it was good. For you, it was good. Um, and then that year was was was. Uh, I had my ups and downs though, because coming home, I, I was nervous to play. I, like I said earlier, I. I might have appeared to be a confident guy, but I, I battled confidence and just, you know, as you get older, you get more. But when I was younger, you're always a little bit of self-doubt. And you always want to, you're battling those inner inner thoughts in your head. So it took me a while uh, to, to get uh, to get going in Ottawa. And I remember Jacques challenged me once early in the season. He brought me in. He goes, you're not playing how we want this. And I got scratched for a game because he wasn't happy. And he challenged me. And then when I came back after getting scratched, I was nervous too. I'm like, holy shit, I'm scratched. I'm in a new team. This could be, you know, the self-doubt starts creeping in again. Right. 
And uh, so the good thing is the next game I came back, because uh, he always challenged me to play more physical and, and be more than just the guy that moves the puck. Like, be a guy that's a little harder to play against. So I uh, I guess I answered the bell for him, and I never got scratched again and ended up having a pretty good season. And uh, I would say the other thing with me too, Pitt, I was fortunate because you know as well as I do, you have to have somebody in your corner that likes you in the organization. Absolutely. And, and anyone that doesn't, that's listening, this would be key for anybody. You got to have one guy in the organization. And for me, it was Pierre Gauthier. Pierre really? Gauthier, Pierre Gauthier was the assistant general manager in Anaheim when Detroit traded me to Anaheim. So really? Pierre was like, Pierre was the guy that brought me to Anaheim. He had scouted me. Wow. And then and then Pierre got the job with the Ottawa Senators. As a GM. So, so Pierre is the one that knew me from Anaheim and brought me to Ottawa. So he, there was something in my game that Pierre obviously liked because he had traded for me twice. Right. And uh, so I had Goche there that liked me as a player and then uh, – and then, uh, so anyhow, that's that's kind of I, I believe that's that's why I was, uh, and I joke about it too because five years later, Ted, I don't know if you remember this, you were gone to Florida, but Goche became the general man. He went back to Anaheim and became the general manager in two thousand and one. Yes. In two in two thousand and one, after five years in the Senators, I signed as a free agent in Anaheim. Pierre Goche signed me. He he acquired me three different times. Wow. So have you ever bought always, have you ever bought him dinner? Well, I say this in the York family, we always give thanks to Pierre Gauthier. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, that's it's brilliant. Funny. Okay. Uh you got you were gonna say something. You got something else to say? No, it's just that in Ottawa, like I think in Ottawa I just I I, I really got I kind of became the player that I Changed my style a little bit from like a point guy to a guy that was more a two way guy, and and then just playing under Jacques and the coaching staff we had, I just I became a I became a good defenseman there with some great coaching. Yeah, so I it's this is if I wasn't living in Minnesota right now, I would be living in Ottawa because mm -hmm. I love that place. Um, have a lot of great friends and. You know, a lot of you are still living there. Um, exactly. You've got a great yeah. alumni. Yeah, great alumni. Great alumni. Yeah. Uh, that was fantastic when we went there for the 100. Were you, were you at the 100-year anniversary? I can't, can't remember. The outdoor game was yeah. there? Yeah, yeah, you were yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just – I was up in our alumni box the other night looking at our picture of Parliament Hill. It's one of the greatest pictures I have of us uh, in front of the Parliament as the backdrop on the rink. And you're seeing all the different guys that played for the centers. It's one of the coolest experiences I've had in my life. Oh, I, I would totally agree. I mean, they, they knocked it out of the park, that yeah. event for the alumni. Mm -hmm. uh, man, that, that was special. Really cool. It was great. It was so great. Um, we're at right around, we're, we're about close to an hour here. So I, I, <laughs> I just, I want to get a bottle of wine and I want to next interview we're gonna bottle of wine i'm gonna make some popcorn and we're, we're just gonna <laughs> dive into it man and there's not gonna be a time <laughs> limit on it but oh, that's great. this was fantastic uh great messaging jason I, I i didn't know that about you i mean i i the one thing about doing this podcast i mean it's great to reconnect with everyone but everyone has their hockey journey that's uh mm -hmm. that's different but they're all similar no one has yeah. the shoot to the moon, you know, on a rocket ship with no no problems or roadblocks or anything. And I know that you have uh, kids that 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 play hockey uh, and other sports that you know have went through a adversity. And you know, us as parents that you know are, that we go through it ourselves. It's it's a different animal when our kids oh, are going through it's it. All, it's all, it's awful. It's awful. Like I am a little bit of a. I can handle myself because I'm in control. Right. But when it, ha when it happens to your children, you're helpless. Um, 
But I'll, hey, I'll tell you, part two of the story pen is better. I got way better stories. More city, more shit hits the fan, more stuff happens. My dad passes away. I, I go through a dark period for a while. And part two is pretty good, too. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sensing there might be, even be a part three. <laughs> you and I, you know, we never played together, I don't think, unless it was, like, because they had no, no other right. option. But no. I kind of feel like they missed some chemistry that we got going on right now. Oh, fuck. You and I would have been brilliant. brilliant. <laughs> I, I, I would have... I would have like eased the guy over to the middle of the ice, like just take the boards away, so he has to, so he has to cut to the middle, so you can catch him with a nice shoulder. <laughs> so, I before I let you go, I just you because you're a point guy, you probably didn't have the relationship with the tough guys on the team, because uh, back then there were designated tough guys. You know, we had Denny Vl, Denny Lambert, uh, just a lot of really battlers phil crow was another one i don't know if you were there when he was there but anyways oh bussy uh, bussy we called him bussy, bussy. Remember? <laughs> <laughs> he, you know it's funny denny and denny vl and i that 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 horrific junior team i played on in hamilton oh really denny was my ride to the rink every day mm. denny and i denny and i have known each other since i've been 17 years old holy cow you Denny would that Denny then became my defense partner in the minors when I was there. Wow, you Denny, uh, go Denny ahead. and I are. I love Danny. Uh, it, it's for sure uh, four episodes now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm I, I I'm actually thinking of writing a book because I got the stuff from my junior the stuff from my junior days. It's there's some great stories, a lot of dark stories. Yeah. And just, um, it's a good story on perseverance. Um, yeah. I've had some stuff happen later in my career. Um, just like when you think it's over, I went to Switzerland and I thought I was done. And then I came back to the league to play one more year and just some fun, some funny stuff. Oh, absolutely. And I think that, you know, for me, when I decided to do this podcast, the first four episodes, it turned out to be four. I had no idea what it was going to be, but I'm like, I'm just going to kind of try to rewind the tape and what's my hockey journey as a player. And it yeah. took me three and a half months to write the script. And it turned yeah. into about, it turned into four episodes that were about 45, 50 minutes long. And, you know, you have kids and all of a sudden your memories start fading and it's them. And to go back and to remember those, you have a great memory. I don't know if I drank more beer than you or what, but... Mine isn't like that. It took me a little longer to uh, retrace them, but it was a great exercise. And I, I think, you know, you wanting to write a book, do it, dude. It's it would, It'll be the greatest thing uh, you've ever done except uh, getting married and having kids. Yeah, no, exactly. I think I, I'm, I've been, I've been toying with the idea because it's like I, I almost quit hockey on. I was going to quit in minor hockey too because yeah. I, I was so upset because of the um, – the father that was coaching my team and I, I was just and he had to, I ended up I was gonna quit. He broke my arm twice as a kid, like um broke my arm in my draft year, played with a cast for two months on my arm. Like it was crazy the stuff we did back then. Yeah. No, it's yeah. uh would you agree that the between the years that I wish I would have paid more attention to that and I wish I would have spent more money trying to get better at managing my own thoughts it, it was yeah, way I, later in my career when i you know finally found out how to start training my mind i wish that for sure um not worrying so much um knowing how to handle coaches too because now that i've coached i know coaches will not that you want to challenge coaches but i find you need to stick up for yourself more in a good way yeah where, co where coaches can sniff out guys, they know they can like kind of, kind of like kind of control, like play games with them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't figure that out till later on my career. But it's, you know what? You're just you're more you know who you are when you're older, and you just and you forget to when you're younger you forget to really enjoy it when you're playing too because it it goes by so quick as you know like like just quit worrying about everything. 
Yeah, well, I, I, I was working with, you know, people that helped me with my mind, and I got down in Florida, and I'm an older guy, and all of a sudden, I have Mike Keenan as my coach. Oh, you had Keenan? Oh! Oh, 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 oh boy. Can, can you, you know, get the pom-poms going, how much fun that was? <laughs> so, anyways, all right, Yorkie. So great to connect with you. I've, I've talked to you more in the last three days than I have in the last probably 15 years. Right. Um, this is it's awesome. Good. We're going to do this again. Are you going on spring break? I can't remember. Yes, you are. We're leaving for Mexico on Friday, gone for like eight days. Okay. So I will, we'll, we'll talk offline here, but uh, I want to get that, uh, this next episode scheduled because I know that. There's a lot of people that are out there listening. Not a lot. Everyone that's out here listening is like, all right, when's the next episode coming out? So um, <laughs> we'll schedule that. So great messaging. Uh, congratulations on uh, so far where you are to Ottawa on uh, just believing in yourself and not giving up because the best is yet to come. And uh, if there's anyone that's out there that's doubting themselves, Listen to this a few times because it's about perseverance and just keeping your head to the grind and believing in yourself and just not stopping. So thank you for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, Pitt, it's great. Oh, a pleasure, man. It's been it's been really, really nice to uh, reconnect with you and have a few good stories and a few good laughs, too. Awesomeness. All right. Until next time, my friend. We'll talk to you. See you, Pitt. All right. Bye. <laughs> The Hockey Journey podcast is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. I had no idea we'd be progressing to a part two and maybe even a part three or four with Mr. York. I guess you'll have to stay tuned and see what happens. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed meeting Jason York and hearing about his hockey journey thus far. To be continued. Lastly, if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon. And do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.